Now to that new campaign taking on masculinity in the wake of the Me Too movement. Gillette releasing a new ad that's getting millions of views and a lot of reaction. Gio Benitez is here with a closer look. Good morning, Gio. Hey, Robin, good morning. Yeah, the ad already has nearly 3 million views on YouTube, and that number is growing. Gillette is asking men everywhere to, quote, act the right way and take a stand against harassment and bullying. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. This morning, Gillette, the men's shaving brand that's been synonymous with manliness. Is this the best a man can get? Is it questioning so-called toxic masculinity with a new ad campaign in the wake of the Me Too movement? Bullying. The Me Too movement against sexual toxic harassment. masculinity. The male shaving brand that used the tagline, the best a man can get for 30 years. We can't hide from it. Is it's been going on far too long. Is now also asking, what's the best a man can be? Because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. The ad already viewed by millions and Gillette pledging to donate $3 million to organizations that help men become role models for the next generation. And there will be no going back. Because we... We believe in the best in men. But not everyone is happy about this ad. One person on Twitter said the video puts all men in bad light. Another said boys are not monsters in waiting. And I'm going to talk about this new ad, this uh, Gillette ad, which goes against what they call toxic masculinity. I think, uh, Brian, you with me now? Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. You know what I'm talking about here. This is a new ad. It's from Gillette, the razor people, going after this um, toxic masculinity and trying to reverse that whole trend in our culture. You think that's a good move for Gillette? Well, I mean, I saw the 60-second spot and the 30-second spot. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Uh, for me, for in particular, yeah, men act badly sometimes, and they don't other times. But why are you going to scold the people that are going to buy you a way too expensive razor that's some, for some reason locked behind that protective glass at stores, and you got to ask a guy with a lot of keys to open up? I don't understand why I got to be berated and uh, because I happen to be a man. Now, there's a man. Uh, th this thing is men usually buy razors, these these male razors. So for the most part. I'm wondering, there are men that behave badly, but it seems as though this ad is skewed towards women who think men behave badly. I don't know. Does the stat show that women buy the Gillette razors? Because if you want a man to uh, buy a Gillette razor, don't give me 12 different illustrations of bad male behavior. It's an interesting concept, though, isn't it? You, you come right out, you jump right into a cultural and political issue, you take a side, you go public with it, and as you say, Brian, you're going after, some, to some degree, the people who buy that product. I'm not sure this is a, a workable ad, but they've done it. But what do you think about the idea of toxic masculinity? This, the, the bullying, the dominance. I mean, that is a feature of being a man, and men do behave badly and boorishly like that on occasion. But this ad seems to me to lump all men together as if they're all bad behavior kind of people. My sense is this. Yeah, men do behave badly, women behave badly, and there's things that could be done. You want to raise a young man to be a gentleman as they get up. They'd be tough when you have to have a steel in their spine, but treat women with great respect. And bullying will never be tolerated at any age. But if you want two brothers, which is depicted in the ad, or two kids rolling on the ground wrestling, if you don't want them wrestling, then don't have boys. Because for the most part, they will wrestle. At times, uh, they'll get each other, they'll, they'll, they'll show an aggression. That's just the way men are made up to be. Don't go ahead and make your ad a way to tell me how to behave badly. You make razors. I don't need life lessons from you. Jude 117 and 18. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. This is the sculpture that's caused so much outrage. Entitled McJesus, it displays a fast food outlet's famous mascot hanging from a cross, an important symbol in Christianity. Hyper Museum has added a disclaimer that it's not meant to cause offense, but it has. <laughs> 
On Friday, hundreds of protesters faced off with police on the streets as they attempted to force their way into the museum to remove it themselves. Others are camping outside until the work is taken down. This is something I kneel for. I redeem it with my soul. I offer it with all the good things. And what do you expect? I first of all felt that this is a big insult, a big insult. I hope that everyone will stand with us in solidarity. The heads of churches across Israel are seeking a court order to have the sculpture removed. We started with the heads of the churches. A petition was offered to the judiciary to remove it. We will continue through peaceful rallies and vigils with the churches, the museum and the municipality. We won't be quiet until we reach a solution. We need to understand that freedom of expression is interpreted in different ways in different societies. We live today in Israel. If this work was directed against non-Christians, the world would be turned upside down. But the director of the museum says he's defending the freedom of art, culture and speech. We understand, fully understand the hurt feeling of the Christians here, but uh, we have to explain to them that this wasn't the meaning and we are sorry that they are uh, offended by this work. The Christian population makes up just 2% of Israel and people in the community say it's a daily struggle to freely practice their culture and religion. They say the work was put up against their will and due to their minority status, their concerns are being ignored. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Peter 2.7 and 8 So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. ISIS claiming responsibility for the attack near a U.S.-led coalition patrol in Syria's northern city of Manbij. This is a brand new video showing just coming into our newsroom a few moments ago. There are reports a suicide bomber targeting coalition forces in the city. This says the U.S. plans to withdraw our military troops from the war-torn country. Straight to the Pentagon and Lucas Tomlinson. What are we hearing here and learning from there, Lucas? Well, Bill, officials here at the Pentagon cannot confirm there are any American casualties today on that patrol in Manbij, a city in northern Syria, but there are open source reports there were American casualties. Just moments ago, the U.S.-led coalition confirmed on a in a tweet that American troops were on patrol in the area. Quote, the U.S.-led coalition is aware of open source reports regarding an explosion in Syria. Coalition forces conducted a routine patrol in Syria today. We are still gathering information and will share additional details at a later time. The city of Manbij in northern Syria was captured by a Kurdish-led force in 2016. Earlier this year, an American Delta Force commando was killed during a raid in the city of Manbij. More proof today, Bill, that ISIS has not been defeated in Syria, despite the pronouncement from the president in a tweet last month. Um, U.S. troops have been patrolling the area and have taken fire in the past few years. But once again, more evidence today that ISIS has not been defeated in Syria and remains a very dangerous place. So all this continues, just to clarify policy here, the movement of pieces and equipment and troops continues in Syria? 
That's correct, Bill. In fact, the U.S. military says they've begun removing equipment from Syria. But again, this is more proof that the war continues. In fact, uh, just in the last few weeks, there have been over a thousand strikes, both U.S. artillery and airstrikes in Syria. What's interesting is last week, the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, you know, when he was speaking in Cairo, said that this is what happened. This could, was what could potentially happen in a U.S. withdrawal. We learned that when America retreats, chaos often follows. When we neglect our friends, resentment builds. And when we partner with our enemies, they advance. We'll uh, update you more, Bill, if we hear anything more from the Pentagon. But right now, the U.S. military cannot confirm American casualties, but there are reports out there that a su an ISIS suicide bomber attacked a U.S. military patrol in the city of Manbij. President Trump fired a salvo on Twitter to Turkey. He warned the U.S. would devastate Turkey economically if they hit the Kurds. Turkey's foreign minister fired back. We have said many times that we are not afraid of the threat and we won't be deterred by any threat. We have said it in the past. Therefore, you cannot achieve anything by threatening Turkey economically. After Trump's threat, the Turkish lira fell 1.6 percent in value. And it's not the first time Trump has affected the Turkish economy. Last year, he imposed sanctions on Turkey after it failed to release imprisoned pastor Andrew Brunson. That helped push the Turkish lira to a record low last August. The Kurds have been allies of the U.S. in the fight against ISIS, but Turkey sees the same Kurdish fighters as terrorists and allied with a Kurdish group inside Turkey called the PKK that's been fighting Turkey for decades. Late Monday, Trump spoke with Turkish President Erdogan about cooperating with Turkey during the pullout of U.S. troops. Last week, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo told CBN News the U.S. will try to meet the needs of the Turks and the Kurds. Well, our, our message is straightforward. Uh, the work that the Kurdish forces did with us alongside in Syria um, has been important. It took down a caliphate and we'll work with the Turks to make sure uh, that there's security for them as well and that the Kurdish uh, people in Syria are indeed protected. Trump also warned the Kurds not to provoke Turkey and raised the idea of a 20-mile security zone along the Turkish-Syrian border. If Turkey monitored that zone, many Kurds and Christians in the region say that would put them in danger, which raises another dilemma. The Kurds may rather align with Russia and Syria, and therefore Iran, if the U.S. doesn't protect them. Chris, you mentioned Kurds inside northeast Syria might align with Syria and Russia. Why would they do that, and why would they want to? Well, they'd want to do that, Ephraim, because they're really terrified of Turkey coming in and invading the whole northeast uh, part of Syria, as well as this 20-mile uh, security zone. Uh, and the, the other thing uh, that would happen if... Uh, right after the uh, U.S. Uh, announced this possible pullout, the Russians and the Syrians came to the Kurds in northeast Syria, and they said, listen, if you align with us, we'll protect you from Turkey. And so that's part of the reason they want to do this. And remember, Ephraim, northeast Syria is very rich in oil. So if they align with Russia and Turkey, that's going to open this part of the, uh, Syria to Iran. Rich oil fields and also gives them a land corridor to uh, shuttle weapons to Hezbollah, which is going to threaten Israel. Chris, you mentioned the Kurds and Christians are afraid of this 20-mile border zone if Turkey is monitoring it. Why does it trouble them so much? Well, you have to look at history, uh, Ephraim, long-term history and short-term history. Long-term history is that many of the Kurds and Christians in this region actually fled in 1915 during the Armenian Genocide. And so that's one thing they do have a collective memory about that. The other thing is short-term history. Last year in a place called Ifrin, which is in northwest Syria, uh, Turkey came in and captured that region. They did it using jihadist uh, Islamists, uh, Al-Qaeda-like uh, uh, mercenaries to come in, actually went house to house searching for Christians. And so that's why the long-term history, short-term history makes them fearful of what Turkey could do. Chris, what are you hearing from Christians in northeast Syria? Well, I talked to a Christian leader uh, yesterday, and, and he said something very poignant. He said, we're surrounded by millions of Christians, and yet we feel alone. I think uh, many times these Christians don't feel connected to the West. They don't perhaps get the attention they feel they deserve. And, uh, and that's why, that's what they're saying to me, is that uh, they need to have that affirmation, that, that connection with many of the Christians around the world, particularly in the United States and the West. 
Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning, he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17.9 In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17.1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. Is there any evidence of Isaiah 17.1 happening anytime soon? An uncharacteristic revelation by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In the last 48 hours, Israel attacked a warehouse of Iranian weapons at the international airport in Damascus. This reflects our consistent policy and firm determination to prevent military entrenchment of Iran in Syria. And if need be, we'll intensify these attacks. It is generally acknowledged by both political and military leaders that Israel acts against Iranian entrenchment in Syria. But it is rare for Israeli officials to acknowledge specific strikes. Now, the Israeli premier is putting the message out not only once, but twice. He went into more detail at a cabinet meeting where he went into the numbers. We took action with impressive success to arrest Iran's military entrenchment in Syria. And in this framework, the IDF has carried out hundreds of attacks against Iranian and Hezbollah targets. Some experts believe this statement has another motive. The decision by the Prime Minister to go public is a decision that will definitely be discussed by both the opposition parties and by the Israeli public, because it's a bit of a far-reaching exploitation on both the political party level and for Israel's security. It also strays from the policy of ambiguity Israel has typically adhered to. You cannot pinpoint one event. It is an accumulation. If there is an attack every week and the Prime Minister talks about it, the consequences are bad. With ambiguity, you can work quietly and it stays out of the political discourse. But the impact could be worse and the cost may be more severe. The accumulative effect of many strikes has a point, and I'm not sure we know how to read it. Whereas the Russians, Syrians and Iranians will say, wait, they are making a joke out of us, and we must put an end to it, and that might exact a price we will have to pay. Will the price that Israel pays be the War of Gog and Magog, spoken of by the prophet Ezekiel? Will the catalyst for the War of Gog and Magog be the destruction of Damascus spoken of by the prophet Isaiah? Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Bethgarma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. 
These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia and Iran are looking to take over Syria, thus putting them at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23 and 39 to 7 and 8 and it will come to pass at the same time when god comes against the land of israel says the lord god that my fury will show in my face for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath i have spoken surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of israel so that the fish of the sea the birds of the heavens the beasts of the field all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence the mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8 and 9 For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Matthew 24, 12 And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Outside this morgue in Nairobi, anxious family members and colleagues wait for news. <laughs> now the siege is over, details of what happened inside the Dusit Hotel are beginning to emerge. Surveillance cameras captured the beginning of the attack, when heavily armed men walked into the upmarket complex. So they're shooting from all over the place. Employees are running all over the place. People are screaming. So at that point, I realized that the best thing to do is to find the safest place to hide. For hours afterward, terrified workers barricaded themselves in as gunfire and explosives rang out. Others jumped from the windows of the Dusit D2, which includes offices and restaurants frequented by some of Nairobi's many expat workers. Survivors spoke of chaos and confusion. We go out they, for the evac evacuation, but they make a big mistake because uh, it was not secure. We go and the Shabab start to shoot to us. Hundreds of others were taken to safety in an operation that lasted through the night. The Somali-based armed group Al-Shabaab says it was behind the attack. It's often targeted Nairobi in response to Kenya sending troops to help protect the UN-backed government in neighbouring Somalia. Kenya's president is vowing justice. We will seek out every person that was involved in the funding 
planning and execution of this heinous act. We will pursue relentlessly wherever they will be until they are held to account. Pictures circulated online appear to show the attackers' bodies. The hotel is now a crime scene and Nairobi's in mourning once more. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5 through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And there is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24 verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.